All right. Well, thanks, everybody. So uh, to my knowledge, is, is this the first time there's ever been a tag team presentation during Mises U? I mean, except for the panel discussions. Yeah, right, except for the yeah. panel discussions. So yeah, this is, I think, the first time we're doing it. And what we're basically going to be demonstrating is that if you double the number of professors, the quality of the lecture does not go up proportionally. <laughs> and so, all right. So obviously, what we're talking about here is modern monetary theory on the Human Action Podcast. Uh, Jonathan and I have, have hit on this stuff a lot, but we thought it'd be good here to encapsulate it. And what we're going to be, we thought the best way to, you know, to keep this kind of entertaining and to, and to keep it fast paced, what we're going to be doing here is sampling from, we've got four clips from a recent documentary that was actually like sh screened in movie theaters, uh, at least in the United States. I don't know, was it around the world? Probably. Uh, probably. That's a good, safe answer. Um, uh, in the United States, for sure. I'll say, just say things that I can confirm. Uh, I'll leave the speculation to Jonathan. And, uh, and so what I want to say, though, is I, I really, I'm talking years ago, I thought this modern monetary theory, or MMT, is going to displace standard Keynesianism as like the chief foe to you know, sound money, Austrian analysis, whatever you want to call it. And I, I have seen that come true, and so I want to warn you not to merely dismiss it and say, like, oh, money, prints or go burr, or, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, you can, you can do that. You're not wrong, but I'm, I'm saying I understand. And this, this documentary, they did a very good job with it, like, just in terms of taking a, a fairly dry subject and making something that's entertaining. And, and you'll see one of the clips we're going to play is a hilarious thing with, you know, an opponent of something. And so they, they just... If you were somebody who was predisposed to want the government to have huge deficits to fund a Green New Deal, single-payer single health care, all that stuff, I can understand why you would watch the documentary and come away thinking, yes, our people are geniuses, and it's these old fuddy-duddies, right-wingers, and, and centrists who don't get it. Okay, So, that's, so here we're going to try to show you that, no, they are wrong and, and to, to uh, motivate it accordingly. All right, you want to play the first yep. clip? Do you have anything you want to add before we dive in? No, no, it's good. Okay. First, what is the deficit? People naturally think, wait, government deficit, bad. This is a negative thing. Let's stop this right now. And I say, hang on, let's open the other eye. So I want us to suppose that I'm the federal government. If I'm government and I spend $100 into the economy, the government spends 100 into the economy, taxes 90 back out. We record on the government's ledger a budget deficit of 10. Minus 10, government deficit. But we forget that on the other side of the ledger, guess what? When they spend 100 in and they only tax 90 out, somebody gets left with 10. That's your surplus. Their deficit is your surplus. Oh, right, you got your surplus from the government's deficit, and all of a sudden, they start realizing that they've been missing part of the story. That's when I show the sector balance graph to audiences. It's the most important chart in the world. Government deficits are almost always seen in a negative light. Nothing but a sea of worrying red ink. That's not how I look at it. Here's what I see. I see what's happening on the other side of the government's ledger. On the other side of the government's deficit is a non-government surplus. Their minus 10 is matched by a plus 10 on somebody else's balance sheet. So my red ink is your black ink. That graph is really the one that when I show it to audiences, it changes everything. So when you see a headline <laughs> like this one, trillion dollar deficits could be the new normal. This is meant to shock and frighten. But take a breath and read it this way. Watch the word deficit. Don't you feel better? Don't you feel better? Trillion dollar surpluses to the private sector could be the new normal. Oh, all right. I'm down. Okay. Okay, that's, that's actually good because as, when we started the clip, and then I was like, you, you know, Jonathan and I, of course, were debating and then like picking the clips for this, and then it started going. I was like, oh man, this could be kind of a long time just to sit here. And then when you guys started laughing, I was like, oh yeah, this actually is funny the first time <laughs> you see it. Um, okay, so joking aside, let me just, and what we're going to do, by the way, is tag team. So I'll do the lion's share of this first one, and then he's going to respond to the second clip like that. It's, I will let him talk at some point, don't worry. Um, <laughs> 
Okay, so the l- let me just first make sure you understand there is a certain logic behind what they're doing. And this is the, like the, the reason we, we led with this is because this is like I think the strongest um, w- element of the MMT rhetorical approach. Because if you just come at that and say, no, that's wrong, this is the stupidest, uh, then they're going to get you because they're going to say, no, no, this is just a tautology. You guys are arguing with accounting, man. And then it makes it look like you don't know the basic you know, sectoral balance flows, right? So there is a sense. So let me just explain the tiny germ of truth and what they're saying, but then go on to say why it's incredibly misleading to focus on that and why what she's leading people to believe with that demonstration is not what actually is justified in terms of the underlying accounting. Okay, so in standard um, accounting, like at an aggregate financial sector level, it is true that the way, and I have quibbles with it, but we don't need to worry about that right now. I'm just saying right now, there is a conventional orthodox way of handling the, the accounting such that in a closed system, the net financial assets sum to zero. Okay, and so the idea is, just very quickly here, because I know we got a lot of material to cover. So, like, if a company issues bonds, all right, so the the outside person who lent money to the company, they have a a $10,000 bond that Apple issued. They could genuinely think as part of our household wealth, we have a $10,000 asset, you know, on our balance sheet in terms of the the household, right? That we have a $10,000 bond. Apple owes us right now a certain amount of money. Maybe it's not due till the future, but the present market value of this thing right now is $10,000. Okay. But from Apple's point of view, that's a liability, right? We owe this outsider who lent us money $10,000. Maybe it's it's a bigger number down the road, but the present market value of our liability is $10,000. So the two of those net out to zero. That's the idea. Okay, and so the only way the system, the private sector as a whole can have net financial assets is if there's some entity outside of the private sector that owes it money. And so how can that be? Oh, it's the government. It could also be like at the external sector. And so if you saw in her charts there, it wasn't literally that every red you know, column was counterbalanced by a black. There was also some gray. And if you, you, know, if you took the time we stopped and you analyzed it, the legend of the map would show that the black was U.S. domestic private sector and the gray was the foreign sector. Um, and so the idea, though, is that, oh, yeah, like the government, for example, if they run a budget deficit, what does that mean? That the private sector is lending money to the feds. We, we accumulate treasuries. So now the amount that the U.S. government owns the private sector collectively is higher. And so from the private sector's point of view, that's a net financial asset because it's offset, you say, by the government's liability. Oh, but the government's not part of the private sector. Okay, so that is the limited sense in which what she's saying is true. And if you go at the MMTers, they're just going to spit back what I just said to you and say, this is just numbers, this is accounting. You guys are, are arguing with accounting. You don't know what you're talking about. You're idiots. Okay, so having said all that, now what, what's the problem with what she did? She's clearly leading people to believe that when the government runs budget deficits, not only is that not a problem, but that's the vehicle, the mechanism by which the private sector is, can even save. You know, that's even possible when she says their red ink is our black ink. Okay, and so it leads you to believe that, oh yeah, in the aggregate, the only way the private sector can get ahead, can like live below its means and accumulate on net is if the government has the foresight and the wisdom and, the, and basically the, the common duty to run a, a deficit, right? And that, of course, is completely wrong. So I'll be real fast here. One way to see it is, you know, Robinson Crusoe. I think you made the joke earlier that uh, we've we've mentioned Robinson Crusoe in every lecture up till now. We're going to keep the streak alive. Robinson Crusoe, on his you know tropical island, by all by himself, certainly has the, the basic economic categories of you know income and capital accumulation, saving, and so forth. If he can pick ten coconuts a day, and instead you know he only consumes nine a day for a while and builds up a stockpile, we can talk about that he's living below his means. He's saving. He's accumulating. Um, you know, wealth and assets and so forth, right? So it's not that there, he needs to find Friday on the island and Friday needs to set up a government and run a budget deficit for Crusoe to be able to save. That's clearly, obviously, not what's going on there, right? And then more generally in a financial context, there's nothing magic about picking the government as the particular sector. I could just as well build a whole framework and rhetorical uh, demonstration around the claim that Hey, you know, a lot of people like the shareholders of Apple, you know, the company Apple, they're concerned that, you know, they were borrowing a lot of money last quarter. But if you think about it, the only way the world minus Apple can accumulate net financial assets is if the company Apple issues bonds and it runs a deficit, right? Otherwise, the world minus Apple can't accumulate net financial assets. Everything I just said there is true, but 
the answer is so what? Who cares? It doesn't, you, you get what I'm saying? That, that's completely irrelevant. And then finally, you might say, okay, so there I'm just kind of showing the symmetry and that there's nothing special about the U.S. government. But actually, to do that demonstration with a government is the worst possible example. Because at least if, if, if you have a bond issued by Apple, and so Apple owes you money, you know that the only way they're going to pay you is if they go out and produce goods and services and earn a profit. You know, they, take, they buy resources and sell them to their customers at a higher price than what they had to pay for the resources. That's how they generate the net income to be able to pay you the interest and then, you know, give you the principal back on the loan you made to them. And so there's a sense in which if that's, if that's viewed as a net asset or as an asset to you, as a gross asset, I should say, it's because Apple's going to go do something productive for the world, for, you know, for society as a whole, at least as measured in terms of economic calculation. Whereas if the U.S. government owns, owes a trillion dollars, let's say, to people in the private sector, there's only two ways it's going to get it. They're going to either run the printing press, which doesn't make us wealthier, or they're going to tax it from us to be able to pass, right? So if I say that, oh, yeah, Jim down the street owes me $1,000, and this, this IOU from Jim, I value it 1000 It's like an asset that I have. Like I got some you know, money in my wallet, and I got this $1,000 IOU from Jim. And then someone says, well, how is Jim going to pay you back? And I say, oh, he's going to stick a gun in my belly, make me give him $1,000 in cash, and then hand it right back to me and say, there you go, I paid back the loan. Is that really an asset anymore? Okay, but that's kind of what it means to say that the U.S. federal government owes the, the treasury holders a bunch of money, that that's one of the ways it's going to get the money to pay them is literally say, give us this money or you're getting thrown in a cage. And so I'm just trying to get you to see, yes, there are some accounting tautologies to back up what you just saw, but the spirit of it, what she's leading you to believe with that is completely wrong. Okay, over to you. So one other thing that I'll add is basically just rephrasing what his last point is that they're they're shifting the perspective. So when they say that the private, excuse me, the public deficit, the government deficit is a private surplus, uh, they're they're making this claim about the group of people, right, that are that are acquiring these government bonds and they're therefore they're entitled to receive payment from the governments in the future. And but then uh, so they think about it from the perspective of the bondholders, but if you think about it from the private sector in general. Like, like Bob said, that money has to come from taxes or from printing, right? So it's, it's, it's taking money from that same group of people, the private sector, to give it to a, uh, other people in that same group. So it's not, it's not a private surplus because it's coming from the same source, right? Uh, I just wanted to you know, say the same thing you said in slightly different words. Uh, this next clip was probably the most famous clip from the documentary. Uh, and this is uh, where they invite uh, Jared Bernstein to talk about why the why does the government borrow uh, money that it can print, uh, and I'll, I guess I'll save the commentary for after. Can you just explain who Bernstein is, like why he's yeah, important? So Bernstein is the uh, chair of economic advisors under President Biden, and he's about as lucid as his leader. I nominate Jared Bernstein, an old friend who's been with me a long time, a brilliant thinker. White House economic advisor Jared Bernstein joins us now from the White House. Thanks so much. The U.S. government can't go bankrupt because we can print our own money. It obviously begs the question, why exactly are we borrowing in a currency that we print ourselves? I'm waiting for someone to stand up and say, why do we borrow our own currency in the first place? Like you said, they print the dollar, so why, why does the government even borrow? Well, um, the, uh, so the, I mean, Again, some of this stuff gets some of the language that the MN, some of the language and concepts are just confusing. I mean, the government definitely prints money, and it definitely lends that money, which is why uh, the government definitely prints money, and then it lends that money by uh, by selling bonds. Uh, is that what they do? <laughs> they, they, um, they, yeah, they, they, um, they sell bonds. Yeah, they sell bonds. Right, since they sell bonds and people buy the bonds and lend them the money. Yeah, so a lot of times, a lot of times, at least to my ear with, with MMT, the, the language and the concepts can be kind of unnecessarily confusing, but there is no question that the government prints money and then it uses that money to, um, uh, 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 so, um, let's see, the, uh, yeah, they, they print money, and they use that money uh, to, um, they sell bonds, they borrow, um, 
Yeah, I, I guess I'm just I don't I can't really talk. I don't I don't get it. I don't know what they're talking about. Like, cause it's like the government clearly prints money. It does it all the time, and it clearly borrows. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having this debt and deficit conversation. So, I don't think there's anything confusing there. <laughs> So you can see why, why this clip was very popular, went viral on social media, uh, make, makes the, the, um, the executive look like a fool because he's got this advisor who can't really articulate what's going on. Um, and so I thought I would, I would provide an answer to Kelton's question. Stephanie Kelton, by the way, is, is the one who asked that question. Uh, so why does the government borrow? Uh, and you can actually flip this question around. You, you can say, why does, the, why does the government borrow money that it can print? But you can, you can flip it around to all the different forms of, of ways that the government acquires money. So like, why does the government tax money that it can borrow? Why does the government print money that it can borrow or tax? So like, th there's this question of like, all these, all these different forms of, of ways of the government acquiring money, why do they do one instead of the other? And my answer is that they're, they're, they have to balance the negative political consequences for these different forms of what's rightly considered expropriation. So the clearest, example is taxation. This is clearly expropriation, a coerced levy on citizens of the United States. Uh, but of course, taxes are unpopular. People don't like seeing money fleeing their paycheck every time they get paid. Um, and so there are negative political consequences there. This is why it's, it's more common to hear politicians run on campaigns saying we're going to lower taxes as opposed to raise taxes. And if they ever do say we're going to raise taxes, it's always on the super rich, the people who can afford to pay more taxes. So there are ne negative political consequences associated with taxing. There are negative political consequences associated with monetary inflation, uh, namely price inflation. So, and we've seen over the past few years that uh, price inflation is, is very politically unpopular. This is something that's forming uh, a lot of the rhetoric of the um, Republican uh, Trump, Trump's campaign is, is you know, attacking all of the price inflation that happened during the, uh, the Biden years. You know, I guess we're supposed to overlook the fact that a lot of the monetary inflation happened under his administration. Uh, but the, the point is that there's these negative political consequences. There are other negative political consequences that are associated with the borrowing decision, uh, namely their impact on interest rates. And so high interest rates are unpopular. Uh, low interest rates, to a certain extent, can be unpopular to the extent that people realize that there's this connection between artificially low interest rates and it causes asset bubbles and, and financial risk and to the extent that people realize Austrian business cycle theory. So the reason why they would choose one over the other is because they're trying to balance these negative political consequences. And so when I made this claim, my claim is basically all of, all of these things that the government does, they're just different forms of expropriation. And the reason they mix them up is to balance the negative political consequences. Uh, there was an MMTer who actually uh, responded to me on Twitter. So I, I made this claim on Twitter and I've, I've written about it in a couple uh, Mises Wire articles. Um, and they actually, they actually agreed with me. <laughs> so and there are only, uh, I'll, I'll read you what they said, that we all agree on this part. The question is how they do it and what the effect is. MMT gets that part right and Austrians get it wrong. And as we'll see in uh, the next clip, actually, uh, th the reason why MMTers are okay with calling it that is because they view the government as this, uh, this entity that can command, mobilize, organize uh, resources to pursue different uh, political ends, which means that they realize that the, the spending, printing, taxing, borrowing stuff that they do is merely a way for them to expropriate the resources from the private sector. They, they would probably just quibble with the, the terminology. It's like, oh, you know, expropriation, stealing, theft, these are all negative terms. Uh, we're mobilizing. We're, <laughs> we're, we're pursuing these higher goals that would not be pursued by, by people in, in unhampered markets. And so uh, one last thing that I'll say uh, about this clip is that it really it, uh, reveals the, the political uh, aspect of, of the entire MMT framework. So as Bob mentioned, they, they sort of set it up as we're just describing the way the world works. We're just describing the way public finance works. Uh, we have these accounting tautologies that we rely on. Uh, but in the end, what they're, what they're trying to do is, is, is inherently political. They're trying to get people to stop asking about how much things will cost. When the government says we're going to uh, build a new road, we're going to do the Green New Deal, we're going to go to the war, um, they, they 
in the MMT framework is basically designed to prevent people or discourage people from asking, how are we going to pay for this? For, and for obvious reasons. And so, and so then MMT has other answers to the question, well, how is the government going to go about commanding those resources um, if, if there's not this problem of acquiring the financing, getting the dollars to do it? So the, the title of the documentary was Finding the Money. And the reason they use that title is because it, from their perspective, uh, that's not a problem for the government. Well, the, the government never faces this issue of having to find the money. We, we print the money, we spend the money into existence. Uh, and so the real question for them is getting the real resources. And so once again, I would, I would simply say that it all comes down to expropriation and balancing the negative political consequences of those different forms of expropriation. Anything you wanna add? Sure, so I just wanna make sure you understood rhetorically what they're doing there because like obviously hard money, you know, right winger types aren't fans of Jerry Bernstein, but in the context of that film, it was the MMTers were holding him up as the, the representation of the orthodox economic thinking when it comes to this stuff, right? And if you saw too that, you know, Stephanie Kelton, when it kind of like introduced him and then flipped to her, and she was saying, I just want, you know, to stand up and say, why are we borrowing, you know, money or money in our own currency that we can print, right? So what's interesting is, from you know, from the MM, from at least Kelton's point of view, and clearly what this documentary was trying to convey in this segment of the film, is they were trying to say this is crazy. This is just a relic of the gold standard era. When yes, the government had you know it made sense to borrow because there was a sense in which the government was just like a big corporation, and just like a corporation, if it wants to spend more than its revenue in a given quarter, it can issue bonds to you know to, to try to rearrange the flows over time. And but now that we have a genuine fiat currency, and particularly if you're a monetary sovereign, which if you read their literature means that you're able to borrow in your own currency, right? So like just like, a, like a, a small South American country, they could still get into issues even if they have a fiat currency because to raise money from international lenders, they might have to borrow in dollars or euros or something. But to say the U.S. government can borrow in U.S. dollars, it can create that. And so their point is it doesn't need to, right? And instead of borrowing money that we can then just print down the road to pay back the, the lenders, why not just you know, print the money, again, you know, metaphorically, it's all electronic at this point, or mostly electronic, at, at this outset, right? So if the deficit's 200 billion in a given year, why not just create the new money there and, and skip this shell game? So that, that's the rhetorical move that they're making here. And again, the point of them asking Bernstein, who's not just some random guy from a you know, mid-tier university, this is the, the leading economic advisor to the White House at this point, when he's doing this, and their point was to show, look at they have no answer. He's fumbling around. Last thing I'll say on this clip is, there were some like friends of Jared Bernstein who were making excuses and say, oh come on, this was a hit piece. You know they filmed it. The, and these interviews, by the way, happened uh, several years earlier. Okay, and like George Selgin was one of Joe Salerno's written a response on Mises.org recently, and they didn't. Apparently, the people being interviewed, they didn't know this is for an MMT documentary. All right, so I'm not saying they were lied to, but like the point was they didn't fully understand the context. And so, you know, that what happened there, but so some people were saying this is unfair, but no, the, the thing, the reason I'm happy for us to guffaw and laugh at that is because if you saw at the end when it was clear, he just talked in a big circle, had no idea, and just said, yeah, it's not very confusing. And then he just took the coffee and did like a power move. Like, yeah. And so like, no, that's, that's, that's why it's okay to laugh. Okay. You want to do the next one yeah. or cue it up? Yeah. MMT goes, hang on, hold up. The question that we should all be asking of a currency issuing government is not, how are we gonna pay for it? We should replace that question with how are we going to resource it? Not the financial resources, but the real resources. How did we pay for World War II? World War II came right after the Great Depression. This was a time of desperation. Uncle Sam didn't take his hat off and go around to the population in the depths of the depression, asking people to chip in just a little bit. This is when the economist John Maynard Keynes wrote that little book and he called it How to Pay for the War. And just judging by the title of the book, you would think, oh, it's gonna tell me where the government got all the money to pay for World War II. And it turns out it has nothing to do with that. It wasn't about how to pay for the war, where to get the money, it was about how are we going to spend all of this money to win the war without causing inflation. That's what the whole book is about. So where did the money come from? 
The federal government has the authority to spend money into existence. The federal government is the only issuer of the currency. Since war production began, we've had more money than there were things to spend it on. The war started and we start spending money into existence like crazy to build for the war effort. The government was going to spend a lot of money, hire a lot of people. By the end of the war, they tell me that we Americans will have billions of dollars saved up. So if you want it, you'll be going out on a shopping spree and bidding up car prices and home prices. You'll be causing inflation. And the government was like, wait a minute, I don't want you trying to spend a lot of money at the same time. Step two, the government started selling freedom bonds or war bonds. The war bonds weren't about financing the government spending. They understood really well the purpose of the war bonds. There are things we as individuals can do right now. First, continue to save our money, to buy and hold all the war bonds we can afford. Do me a favor, delay your consumption. Wait until after we win the war. Buy only what we really need and pay no more than ceiling prices. Economists understood the government can't run out of money. They were focused like a laser on finding the resources and releasing resources from other uses so that we could build the tanks and the fighter planes. The city of Detroit was completely transformed. Detroit didn't produce any new cars between 42 and 45. To solve climate change, we need to move probably around 10% of GDP or the nation's production to decarbonize transportation, energy, agriculture, housing, We've done this before. We had to move 50% of the nation's production to fight the war. We did it. So the experts tell us that we have less than a decade if we're going to avert the worst impacts of climate change. The clock is ticking. Do we have the resources to do what needs to be done? Finding the money is the easy part. That's the simplest part of this whole conversation. Where will the money come from? What matters is whether any proposed new spending carries heightened inflation risk. What doesn't matter is whether it adds to the deficit or whether it increases the size of the debt. OK, so first of all, I just love the old time, you know, World War II, you know, the, the way they talk about a piece of it. I'm here to tell you the book you need to read is Human Action. Go out there and get it right now. Um, <laughs> OK, so the thing, um, OK, so f first of all, let me just make, connect this with the previous slide or the previous clip. Do you notice they actually answered their own question, right? And it, was, and it confirmed what Jonathan was saying. So again, it's interesting, on, on Twitter, which is where Jonathan and I spend most of our day, um, <laughs> When, when they, that Jared Bernstein clip was making the rounds, and then I came out, and I think I did a whole episode of the Human Action podcast responding, saying, you know, wh why is it that, the, why does the government bother borrowing in, in its own currency and that sort of thing, I explaining that idea and giving, you know, the answer Jonathan said that, yeah, they, they need to get resources in some way, and if they print, you know, there's pros and cons from the government's point of view of either way of, or the three different ways, you know, taxation, borrowing, or printing of, of getting the funds to, to pay for something, and, you know, the, the public reacts differently. And again, some of the, MM, the more nuanced MMT people came back and basically agreed with us and just said, yeah, this, this is what we've been saying. You, the good thing you guys are catching up. Whereas other ones were like, no, you guys are idiots. There's no reason the government, that a sovereign, monetary sovereign needs to borrow money. So notice here in the, those World War II clips when they were talking about how wise Keynes was and the people running the, you know, the military apparatus back in World War II, you, you saw it, it, it was you know, fast. And I don't know, some of you in the back could make it out. But like, there were posters and things saying to people, don't spend your money, buy war bonds instead. So that's underscoring what Jonathan was saying, that, yeah, the reason a government might issue bonds, even if it has a printing press at its disposal, is that will tamp down inflationary pressures, right? That if, if the government's printing a bunch of money to buy tanks and whatever, and now the public in that new environment would end up having double the quantity of dollars, well, that would make prices go up. And so if they want to arrest that, what they can do is issue bonds, and that, in a sense, sucks some of those dollars out of circulation back into the government's coffers to defer it down the road, okay? And so that's, you know, it's, it's like a way of intertemporally managing when the flow of those new dollars hits, okay? So you can kind of defer the inflation. So if you think of inflation just as another type of tax, just like um, if the government runs a deficit rather than just explicitly taxing in the present period, what does that do? Well, it's not that it makes it free, 
But what it does do is it, it defers the impact of the tax. Okay, and Mises talks a lot about this, um, and it's it's interesting. He he says that paying for a war via inflation is undemocratic. And what he means by that is to say, if the major powers going into World War One, for example, if they had just explicitly either levied taxes or even just borrowed, but didn't resort to the printing press and kept their currencies tied, you know, to the respective gold redemption rates under the classical gold standard, he said, you know, the, the various members of the public of the, the different countries they wouldn't have supported it. That they they would say, no, this is way too expensive. You got to sue for peace. You, we can't continue this this conflict. It's too expensive because the, you know, the explicit taxation, how high interest rates would have had to go if they were just being honest with it and, and like legitimately taxing and borrowing to finance the expenditures. But they didn't do that, and so then it's, you know, it, it, it shows up in, the, in, in rising prices. And so Mises' point was, if you know that through explicit taxation and borrowing, the public would not go along with the spending agenda, then that's a sense in which you're admitting what you're doing is against what the public wants. And so that's what he meant when he said inflationary finance like for a war is undemocratic. Um, so having said all this, again, this is, you come full circle and then the MMT, you know, the, their big essential insight is, hey, 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 because the government has a printing press now legally, that we don't need to worry about coming up with dollars to pay for stuff. The only downside at this point is price inflation. See, aren't you guys glad that we entered the chat? <laughs> and when it's like, this is not new, right? You can go read, like Rothbard and Man Economy and State lays it out saying, you know, there's three ways the government can finance an expenditure through taxation, borrowing, or inflation, okay? And then he just, you know, discusses what happens, the implications of each. So this is nothing new. And it's not like Rothbard invented that. He was just distilling down and crystallizing what economists had, had known all along. So that's, that's what I'm saying is the MMT people, it's this interesting blend of they think they're adding something novel to the conversation and they're, they're really not. They're like the, the true things they're saying economists knew and the stuff they're saying that is novel is wrong, right? And, and, yet, and they're getting mad, like how come you idiots aren't catching up to us? All right, so again, let me just put it to you this way. Certainly in the you know, right wing tradition of you know, hard money types, people have known that governments resort to the printing press to finance the war effort. This, in fact, that's one of the main reasons like Ron Paul and people like that are saying end the Fed is because they're saying that's what allows the US to engage in all of this you know, rampant militarism around the world. If we had to actually pay for stuff, honestly, and I keep doing honestly quotation marks because meaning taxation, which you know, is, is one would say is not honest, but you get what I'm saying, like at least more transparently that the public understands, oh yes, money's being taken from us to pay for all these bombers and whatever to spread democracy to the Middle East or whatever the latest adventure is, then you know, the public would stand up to it. And so it, it, the public would not favor all that spending if they actually understood the genuine cost. Whereas if it's just prices are rising, you know, the government can blame, oh, it's the unions or it's the, you know, the, the OPEC countries are jacking up the price of oil. We can't help it. You know, it's uh, greedy corporations all of a sudden. The greed went up in 2022 for some reason, right? So that's the way they, they handle it. Um, and then the last thing, just you can see that the, the link to the Green New Deal. So among all the other reasons that, you know, major wars and where the public kind of lets the government do unorthodox things and violate its own rule book, well, hey, there's a war going on, so that's why, you know, we can have concentration camps in the United States, because, hey, there's a war and that kind of stuff, is that then that's a precedent for peacetime initiatives, right? So now they can understandably say, like the progressive proponents of a Green New Deal can say, and I understand where they're coming from, that, whoa, hang on, when you guys wanted to go back and invade Iraq again, it, you know, nobody was asking how are we going to pay for it, right? You just found the money. So that's what, you know, climate change is just as important as your uh, neocon adventures, right? And so you can see, so, you know, the, re the right answer from a fiscal hawk point of view is to say, yes, both enterprises, you know, were wrong to uh, finance it through inflation. But my point is, right-wingers get into trouble when they are okay with using government deficits and finance and inflationary finance for the stuff they like. And then the, you know, the progressives are just gonna flip it back on them. But, uh, I'll give you a bit of a recommended reading since in this clip they were talking about mobilizing resources. So like the question is not about finding the money, it was like, where are we gonna get the resources? And their thinking is, as long as we can get the resources out of the economy without causing too much price inflation, then it'll be okay. So the constraint is, is price inflation. And so I recommend that you read uh, The Theory of Idle Resources by W.H. Hutt, uh, where he 
he talks through all of the different uh, w uh, meanings or, or interpretations of, of this word idol and what it might mean in an economic sense. Um, and I'll also refer you back to, uh, um, in, in one of uh, Peter Klein's lectures, he, he mentioned that uh, sometimes resources are, they look like they're idle, like a, an empty factory, simply because the person who owns that factory is anticipating a higher price or, or some profitable use of that, uh, of that factory in the future. And so it, from like an outside perspective, it might look like, hey, this factory is empty. Why don't we put it to good use? Uh, but the answer is just allowing people to own and, and make their own decisions about how to use the resources that they have is, is the way that we profitably, productively, sustainably use resources, even the ones that look like they're idle. So uh, once again, that reading is W.H. Uh, Hutt, The Theory of Idle Resources. So I highly recommend it. Okay, move on to the next clip here. The first kind of business was barter. But what would you trade in a hardware store for a gallon of paint? Money has evolved from an age-old search for a satisfactory medium of exchange. Money should be something of value. Gold and silver emerged as the most durable, most satisfactory money. For greater convenience, men started to out gold and silver coins with values imprinted on them. Later, governments took over the exclusive function of finding money. <laughs> Everything is wrong with that story. If you look at any economics textbook, it's almost exactly always the same story. The barter story fits into the mainstream ideology. They want to start with the market the private market with no government. And then much later in their story, the government comes along to use some of that money, like the rest of us. The problem with that story, number one, when was there ever this barter market? Money has existed for thousands of years before markets were developed. And rather than gold, for most of time, people have used clay or sticks or shells or paper, things that don't have apparent intrinsic value. Why? There are monies that you will not even see in physical form. If we take ancient Egypt, the Deben never changed hands. It was simply a virtual record. And the reason is because money is not a physical object, it's, it's a unit of measure. And it's a record of a social debt relationship. The earliest forms of money that we find are Mesopotamian clay tablets. It appears that in the very beginning, the authorities would impose taxes in kind, say two goats or maybe one cow. You could think of money much the way we think of centimeters, inches, pounds. The development of a money unit of account is conceptually a bit more difficult because you can use it to value things that have apparently nothing in common. A bushel of wheat versus a goat. Ancient Mesopotamia had complex social organization, structure, production systems. And like every society, they had to keep track of things. The clay tablets were the counting records. They were like little ledgers. In fact, these are the earliest records of writing. So writing wasn't invented by poets, it was invented by accountants to solve the problem of producing and distributing real resources, like bread, labor, livestock, beer. Money is not itself a real resource. Money is a tool invented by political authorities to organize and mobilize real resources. So here, obviously, in this clip, they're critiquing the Mingarian view of the origins of money. 
And so I'll just quickly give you uh, an overview of, of the way Menger described the origins of money and then also talk about Mises' regression theorem. So th they're very similar. They're, they're, you can think about them as going in opposite directions. So Menger was talking about how uh, pe people would uh, realize the, the limitations of barter. So there, there's this double coincidence of wants problem. Uh, it's hard for me to find trading partners that want the things that I have and I want the things that they have. Um, and so somebody has this bright idea of accepting something in exchange, not for their own direct use, but so that they can use it in a second transaction to get the thing that they actually want, right? And so, and so there emerges indirect exchange. So it, it has to do with people, you know, acting with a purpose. People realize there's this limitation, and so I had this nifty idea that I can that I can act on to actually to get what I want from the market. And so then people start to, they see this sort of thing, hey, that is a bright idea. He was, he was able to get what he wanted out of the market by, by trading, doing two trades to, to get what he actually wanted. Uh, so maybe I'll do the same thing. And they might choose to use this, the same good that the other person used as a medium of exchange. Um, and so people, through trial and error, through experimentation, they, they realize that certain goods uh, have this ha have characteristics that allow them to be useful as a medium of exchange. And through this process, we get to a money where, where one good is chosen, or sometimes two goods are chosen by the, the market for the medium of exchange. And once we get that, then we can start to use it as a unit of account because all prices are, are denominated in the same unit. So we can do economic calculation, civilization expands, right? So this, that's the Mingarian story. Uh, uh, Mises worked in the opposite direction. He, he was trying to explain the, the, what determines the purchasing power of money today. And his answer was, well, we have this, uh, this short-term memory. We have this record of, of past prices, which we use to help us inform what prices will be uh, in the future. So if I'm going to accept money in an exchange today, then the reason why I would, ex I would uh, accept the money today is because I expect people to accept it in the future. So I have this expectation that people use it in the future. Now, how much money should I uh, accept today? Like, what is the least that I'm willing to accept in, in exchange so that I can receive this money? And that's going to be informed by what you expect prices to be. And your expectation of future prices is going to be based on uh, your experience of prices in, in recent history, right? So what prices have prevailed on the market uh, before you accepted it in exchange. And so that, that's why it's called the regression theorem. So the basis for the determination of today's purchasing power is based on what, was, what were prices yesterday. And so some people attack this view saying that it's circular, uh, but of course uh, it's not circular because it goes back in time. So what explained the purchasing power of money yesterday? And the answer is, well, it was the purchasing power, the array of prices on the day before that, and so on and so forth. Until you get to the point where it, the first time that good was used as a medium of exchange, which means that somebody had to value it first. So the reason why the, the first person uh, would accept something in exchange that he doesn't want for his own direct use is because he knows, he expects, that somebody else will value it in exchange. And so that, that explains why monies originate on the market as commodity monies, things that have existing, people value it before it becomes money. And that explains how prices can emerge, exchange ratios for that good can emerge from barter to indirect exchange until we have a fully developed monetary economy. So that that's just and that's uh, it, it's it's incontrovertible. It's it's uh, th this is something that must must be the case. If you if you tried to plop a bunch of pieces of paper on an economy and and like you're a king and you, you want to say hey everybody start using this as money, there would be this there would be this chaos. So like what prices should I pay? What prices should I accept in this in this paper? And of course there's an there's another clip that. Uh, from the documentary where they showed that the colonial governments tried to influence people to accept the paper money by pointing a gun at them, saying, we're going to collect this, this, these pieces of paper in taxes, and that's why you should accept it. One last thing that I'll say, and then I'll let uh, Bob wrap it up with just a few seconds left, I guess, uh, is that they, they cherry-picked these examples. So they talked about the Mesopotamian clay tablets. They talk about the Egyptian Deben. Uh, if, you look, if you look at other sources besides these guys, uh, you'll realize that the Egyptian Deben was a unit of weight, right? And they used they used gold or they used uh, copper as as the metal to establish that weight, probably helping them establish how much things weigh that they're that they're trading. Uh, and the clay tablets were records of what resources were stored in which storehouses, right? So it's we we don't have uh, 
we don't have video evidence of people trading these clay tablets around, so we have to sort of speculate on how they were used. But the, o the overarching point is that they, they selected these, these couple of examples when they're ignoring the rest of human history, right? So going all the way back to uh, 550 BC, we see people starting to use gold coins. And even before that, in Lydia, they were using gold and silver as money. And then they started to coin it. So it, the, the course of monetary history throughout the world is one in which people decided to start using precious metals. Then governments take over the coining process. Then they start debasing it. You see this in the Roman Empire. You see this uh, even in US history where they start changing the values of the money that they've co-opted. Uh, so money originated on the market and then it was co-opted by, by the government. And I'll just say so. MMT is very misleading. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>